in my mind, it was pretty clear. The original objective was always take over the all of Ukraine, maybe not physically, but at least enforce the uh, removal of Zelensky, merge it into bigger Russia like Belarus 2.0. But that changed the first week to 10 days. They had to rake adjustments and that shift the concept of Novorossiya. Do you think that that was the original goal? They honestly would have been fine leaving a rump state in the West. It'd be a landlocked state like Hungary. Yeah, they, they assumed they were getting 60 to 70 percent of the country and they're barely holding on to 20 at the moment. This is the Global Gambit. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Piotr, and this is The Global Gambit, it's a podcast where we have interesting conversations with many a different people and perspective about current events, geopolitics, macroeconomics. If you haven't already, go and check out part one with Jake Bro, a channel on YouTube who does a many amazing content on the situation with Ukraine and Russia, uh, the ongoing war, and whether or not things could change in 2024. Jumping over then a little bit more to Russia itself, what do you think is the effect and success of the Russian war machine, propaganda machine, you know, Putin's ability to command such popularity? We've got the election in, uh, what, three, four months in May. What do you, what, what's your take on the sort of just internal Russian dynamics about this? And where you think it could go? As far as effectiveness of the Russian propaganda machine, I think it's unified a lot of people who just hate the West for whatever reason. Yeah, there's plenty of good reasons why people would be upset with the United States, given the United States intervention policies over the last 70 years. Um, but there's just a lot of people that have resentment against the old British Empire or they used to be a French colony, and Russia's always had an empire, but Russia never had a good navy. If Russia was competent at building ships in the 1800s, they happily would have gone to Africa or Asia and had uh, overseas colonies. But the Russians, their empire was all land-based. They would just march in a direction until they hit a mountain. Uh, they, they subjugated and conquered and erased the ethnic identity of, of all these people across the Eurasian continent. But they've been really successful at finding people who just hate the West for whatever reason. And they say, support us. Doesn't matter what we did in our history. We didn't do it to you. And we're the ones taking on the big bad West, the old colonial powers. And, and, and they willingly do it. Uh, these accounts that I see, these people from Africa or the Middle East uh, cheering on Russia and promoting their narrative and propaganda just because they hate the UK or France or the United States for whatever reason. So it's creepy that there's all these people on social media from Pakistan or Iran or Nigeria or whatever cheering on what the Russians are doing when they don't really care about Russia. They don't they don't care about Russian soldiers dying in this pointless war. They just want to see the West bleed. They just want to see the West hurting and suffering and, and failing because that makes them feel better, even though the West failing or, or being defeated isn't going to improve their local economy or their standard of living wherever they are. 100%. It's not going to make any relative difference to their situation. Um, and whenever I'm in a discussion with people who come from different parts of these regions i try to emphasize that sure the west has done a lot of bad things made a lot of mistakes but to suddenly think that russia is your savior and not going to try to exploit you in the same way is rather naive like this whole situation in the sahel and the coups suddenly thinking that the wagner group is your sort of go-to like good samaritans uh, i'm not sure guys on that point, one of the things that I am very interested for your take on is, you know, the argument from these camps often is that the original goal was never to take over the entirety of Ukraine. It was to simply rid it of the, uh, you know, Nazification and the, uh, and biolabs and all that sort of stuff. But in my mind, it was pretty clear. The original objective was always take over the all of Ukraine, maybe not physically, but at least enforce the uh, removal of Zelensky and eventually merge it into the sort of bigger Russia, like a bit like Belarus, right? Belarus 2.0. But that changed after sort of the first week to 10 days. They had to rake adjustments and that shifted to sort of the concept of Novorossiya, which is the, you know, former part of Ukraine, which was under the Russian Empire in the late, late 19, uh, 1800s. 
What's your take on that? Do you think that that was the original goal? Or do you think they have now settled on largely just trying to keep hold of these um, occupied territories in the East? Well, I think Russia would have been happy taking 100% of Ukraine. But if we actually, you know, that was a fly on the wall of the Russian planners that first day. Yeah, obviously they wanted to take the capital city of Kiev. They assumed everything east of the Dnieper River was, of course, Russia and theirs. So the city of Kharkiv and Sumy and Chernihiv. Uh, but I think they honestly would have been fine leaving a rump state in the west, like the mm. Lviv western area. Mm. I, I don't think they ever, like if anyone who didn't want to live in the new Russia, everything east of the Dnieper, they can go to the rump state. It'd be a landlocked state like Hungary. And Russia would have been fine if that country stayed Ukraine, but they wanted all the best parts of Ukraine. They wanted the coastlines. They wanted to get Odessa. They wanted to link up with Moldova. Um, Ukraine's discovered oil and gas reserves are in the east and, and off the coast of Crimea. So if, if Russia took everything of value, leaving this landlocked rump state that couldn't even get their grain exports out without going through Russian territory and then therefore paying Russian tariffs. They would have been fine with that. But yeah, they, they assumed they were getting 60 to 70 percent of the country and they're barely holding on to 20 at the moment. They keep scaling back their ambition, but they annexed these four oblasts and put it in their constitution without controlling them. How do you how do you annex the city of Zaporizhia, seven hundred thousand people, and hold a referendum and vote to do it, and and you didn't control the city? The majority of Zaporizhia lives in Zaporizhia city, and you don't control the city, and you just say, "Oh, that's Russia now. We voted on it." It's bizarre, but <laughs> uh, militarily, they're never going to they're never going to reach the geographical border of Donetsk. Their military is incompetent. They're they're not going to get there. But then people will counter what you're saying by, well, emphasizing Eastern Ukraine is much more Russified, even prior to their efforts in the past 10 years and so on. They, Russia has a stronger presence. There are people in these parts of Ukraine who want to be associated more with Ukraine. If you look at a map of the 1991 referendum or something, I'm pulling an example out of the air, right? Um, they'll say that the further east you go, the more Russian it is, and therefore it is never really truly part of Ukraine, and therefore what they're doing is somehow reasonable. It, that's just totally bizarre. This is very dangerous, what the Russians have done weaponizing their language, saying mm. that anyone who speaks Russian is Russian, therefore belongs to the Russian country, empire. That should be our territory if they're speaking Russian. But people speaking Russian is the remnants of the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. If you wanted a seat at the table and to participate in the political process at all, when you were part of the Soviet Union, you had to speak Russian. You had to learn Russian to go to Moscow. But when you think about the old empires, how many countries in the world speak Spanish? There's like 20 that speak Spanish. Just because you speak the same language doesn't mean you have to be the same country. These are the remnants of the Spanish Empire. How many countries in the world speak English? Because there's like 20 or something. These are the remnants of the British Empire. It's okay to speak the same language and be a separate country. Same thing with speaking Arabic. How many Arabic speaking countries are there in the world? The remnants of the Caliphate or an Arabic Empire that spanned across North Africa. Just because you speak the same language doesn't mean you need to be the same country. So I reject that argument. And a good counter to that is. President Zelensky is a native Russian speaker. And in the last presidential election, he won the Russian speaking areas. It was, uh, 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 who was the other guy? Poroshenko won the Ukrainian speaking territories. So for the people who speak Russian, their preference, according to the election results, overwhelmingly was President Zelensky. So... I want to talk now a little bit about what you think for the coming year. What do you think your expectations are in the build up to the summer when we have seen, you know, more activity begin to occur? And then I've got one more question for you after that. Well, this is a war of attrition. It's all about 
out ratioing the Russians to just Russia is three times bigger than Ukraine. So every Ukrainian soldier has to eliminate more than three Russian soldiers before they give their lives for their country. That's a brutal way to phrase it. This is war. But Ukraine's doing it. Everywhere that Ukraine is engaging, in Avdivka, uh, even on the left bank in Kherson, everywhere the Russians go, they're so incompetent. And really, it's a slave army with no motivation. But the Russians are taking horrendous losses. And the question is, how much longer can they do this? Ukraine's going to go forever. They're going to go to the last man. They're never going to accept slavery to the Russians. But there's going to be a breaking point at some point for the Russians. They're, they're not going to keep doing this when the West is never going to stop supporting Ukraine. Maybe the United States stops, but that's not going to stop the Scandinavian countries or the UK or Germany. Hungary can do all they can to obstruct. It's still not going to stop, especially the Eastern European countries from supporting Ukraine. So the Russians are going to keep taking horrendous losses and they're going to hit a breaking point. Is that going to be this year in 2024? I hope so, but possibly not. And when we see all these utility disasters and how much the civilian population of Russia is suffering right now in the cold, it's only going to get worse next winter. Their ability to maintain their society is going to keep degrading. And this is having an impact on the minds of ordinary Russians. And if Putin loses the support of the pensioners, because inflation is so bad that their pension can't even buy groceries anymore, there will be a breaking point. We will get there. So, okay, let's pretend this is end game scenarios, right? But there have been a, some few radical suggestions a frozen conflict, a DMZ like North South Korea, to you, you know, use your expertise, right? And this just becomes a forgotten about war where they occasionally shoot pot shots, but they never sign a peace agreement. It's just an armistice, and we sort of live with this situation. Um, or Western fatigue does suddenly ramp up for whatever reason, let's say we, we can't foresee it. Um, China decides to send more than non-lethal aid to the Russians. The Iranians deepen their partnership with the Russians because of what's happening now in the Middle East. Are you not concerned that we might not see an outright victory for Ukraine and that we have to settle with some kind of marginal victory negotiated on off the battlefield rather? People pushing the idea of freeze the conflict, a DMZ, those are people living comfortably in the West with the luxury of thinking, well, that would be nice. That would be easy for me. Let's do the thing that is easiest for me. Yes, I like this idea. <laughs> when they're not even considering the Ukrainians, the idea that, let's say his name, Trump, can get elected president and then force a deal. That's not how this works. If the United States stops militarily supporting Ukraine and giving Ukraine any help, well, we have no leverage over them. We can't tell them what to do. They're going to continue fighting this war regardless because they know who the Russians are. They know what the Russians want. And they know that any kind of peace treaty or armistice or, or freeze in the conflict is just a temporary reprieve so the Russians can rearm, conscript more people, and come back for more territory in two, three, four, five years from now. We're, we're in the exact same situation. Nothing will get better. So no, we're going, to, we're going to resolve this. We're going to deal with this now. Ask any Ukrainian what they think, and there's no hesitation. People pushing this idea of a frozen conflict or a DMZ, they're policymakers in the West who don't actually talk to or consider what Ukraine is willing to do. I agree. And someone who's been there firsthand, I can sense the unwillingness to to give in and it's very difficult i think for us not there to fully appreciate that but what i do appreciate is your time jake i really appreciate your sincere and straightforward answers it's been a, a real pleasure is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with any final takeaways i wouldn't be making these videos if i didn't believe ukraine was going to win and russia will be defeated given the level of corruption and competence across every aspect of russia when people say Russia is too strong, they'll never collapse. My counter to that is uh, Russia's collapsed twice in the last century. 
based on historical precedences, aside from, let's say, Argentina, what country is more likely to collapse than any other country in the world? And the answer is Russia. Every day, things, mysterious fires, things burning down, natural gas production going down, oil production going down. Everything is breaking without Western engineers and expertise and Western funding, Western capital. Russia has a lot of reserves, but they're going to exhaust them at some point, and nobody's going to help them. No one's going to bail them out. And the elite in Moscow are going to turn on each other. It's just a question of time. Thank you very much, Jake. And I appreciate you entertaining my counter questions to you with your own counterpoints, some of which I think are extremely valid and I will be adopting into my uh, repertoire as well. For you watching, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please check out Jake's content if you haven't already. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in the next conversation here on the Global Gambit. Take care.